Hey, happy Friday. Thanks for joining me. I'm Carla with Race to Walk, and it's time for our weekly Bible study. And today we're going to be looking at what Jesus meant when he said, I am joined. But before we get started, a little bit about this channel. Here we share good thoughts about good words. And on Fridays, I host a live Bible study on Instagram at Race to Walk, and then I publish two videos a week. I publish a replay of that Bible study video as well as a video about books. So if you are interested in either of those things, be sure to like and subscribe and hit the bell for notifications so you can get updates about new videos. So we are on week four in our Bible study series on the I am statements in the Bible. And this is actually a redo because I got all the way through and we were into a prayer time at the end and my phone died. And so I lost the Bible study before I could download it. So hopefully I, I've done that before, but it's been a while. So hopefully this is, this one is, we had some good stuff in the first one. So hopefully I can cover all that again. So um, if you are interested in looking at other Bible studies I've done, you can go to racetowalk.org forward slash Bible dash studies. And I have a list of all the Bible studies that I've done since for the past almost two years since I started doing this. And um, it, there'll be playlists there so you can go through them if, if you'd like to. But uh, we are going to be starting in John chapter 15 if you want to grab your Bible and get a notepad. But, um, but first, let's start this with a prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for this day, for this time. Lord, we invite in your presence of the Holy Spirit, and we thank you that you are our teacher and our guide. And we rebuke every single thing that raises itself up against the knowledge of you, Lord. Will give us eyes to see your word clearly, give us ears that we can hear your word, and give us a heart that is willing to seek after you. In Jesus' name, amen. We are going to start in John chapter 15, verse 1, and this is again New Living Translation. I am the true grapevine, and my father is a gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my word in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. There are two main, main themes here in this, what he's saying. The first is one about position. So we have to remain in him, right? And the second is about fruit. We have to be fruitful. So his true followers will be fruitful. We've done other Bible studies about, you know, what does it mean to bear fruit? And the the key passage in the New Testament that illustrates what this looks like is in Galatians 5, 23 through 24, where Paul writes, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And this is what should be evidenced in someone's life. And so if you are looking at someone says they're a Christian and, but you're looking at their actions and their actions don't line up with those things after a period of time, if there's no change, then you would be justifying in doubting whether they were really Christians because salvation, we are justified when we, we make Jesus, the Lord of our life. We are at that point, we have been grafted into him, right? So that is that moment of justification. It's, uh, Derek Prince described it as justification as it's just as we've never sinned. We are in Christ, but we have to be fruitful and we still have a choice about how we act, right? We choose to follow him or we don't. And so sanctification is a progressive process. Once we make Jesus the Lord of our life, once we are grafted into him, um, he is our true vine and we have his spirit within us, but we choose to whether we respond to the spirit, right? So you know, Jesus said, whoever denies the son of man can be forgiven, but whoever denies the Holy Spirit can never be forgiven either in this world or in the world to come. And so it's that conviction of the Holy Spirit that we have to respond to. And if we respond to it, then we will have the fruit of the spirit, right? Which are those, those things. And so sometimes it, it takes a little bit of time to really see what the fruit is. So sometimes when people become Christians, they have this, you know, the all, they're very excited about it, right? But the true test is over time. It, it has to prove out. They have to, 
you know, that that's part of the reason that it said in the letters in the New Testament where it gives instructions for, is for choosing leaders in the church, that it's not to be new Christians because their faith hasn't cured enough. You don't know if it's going to stand. They haven't had, uh, they haven't had to walk it out. And so in order for someone to really be a good leader in the church, you have to have seen that, that proof out in their life. And so we're going to touch a little bit more about that later on. Now, there was a comment that came up on another video last week and they were, the person made a comment that, uh, we are Israel, that the church is Israel. I think based on the rest of their comment, what they were meaning by that is that when you accept Jesus and you're a believer that you are Israel, like you're Jewish. Um, I've talked to a lot of people that actually believe that. And the thing is there is replacement theology, which believes that, the church replaced Israel as God's covenant people, but this is actually a different form of it. And so it's actually putting the salvation in Israel rather than Jesus. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But first I want to read a commentary from the Net Study Bible. So this is a Net Study Bible. It's a translation, but also it has a lot of notes in it that are more textual. So this is like the actual text and then all the rest of it is just comments on it. So it gives context to some of the, um, the sayings It will give commentary on different opinions on translations or how specific words were translated. It's more focused on the text rather than like the New Life Application Study Bible will take the themes from the Bible and give com the commentaries fo is focused on how you can apply that to your life, life application. That's why it's called that. So this is comments on verse one, where Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is a gardener. I am the true vine. There are numerous Old Testament passages which refer to Israel as a vine. Psalms 88 through 16, Isaiah 5, 1 through 7, Jeremiah 2, 21, Ezekiel 5, 1 through 8, 17, 5 through 10, 19, 10 through 14, and Hosea 10, 1. The vine became symbolic of Israel and even appeared on some coins issued by the Maccabees. The Old Testament passages, which uses this symbol, appear to regard Israel as faithless to Yahweh, typically rendered as Lord in the Old Testament, and or the subject of severe punishment. Ezekiel 15, 11 through 8 in particular talks about the worthlessness of wood from a vine in relation to disobedient Judah. A branch cut from a vine is worthless except to be burned as fuel. This fits more with the statements about the disciples, John 15, 5, than with Jesus' description of himself as the vine. So we can see here that there's this very strong identification by Israel with the vine. So like we have our sim national symbol as the bald eagle. So they saw it as the grapevine, as their national symbol at times. So as I was reading this, there's a passage in Matthew. John the Baptist is actually calling out the Pharisees and warning them. So keep in mind, Israel identifies with the grapevine, right? Okay. And this is Matthew chapter three. This is talking about John the Baptist. When he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to watch him baptize, he denounced them, saying, You brood of snakes, he exclaimed, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, We're safe, for we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now, the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. So this he's speaking to the religious leaders, right? He's saying the acts of God's judgment is waiting and you're going to be cut off if you don't repent. This is what he's saying. Sometimes there's a lot of con confusion about this. So in the comment last week, they were, the person was saying, well, we are Israel. And I think what, again, I think what they meant was that we have been grafted in. So we're going to go back and we're going to read more of this comment on this statement. This is, again, this is from the Net Study Bible. Okay. So Ezekiel 17, 5 through 10 contains vine imagery, which refers to a king of the house of David, Zedekiah, who was set up as king in Judah by Nebuchadnezzar. Zedekiah allied himself to Egypt and broke his covenant with Nebuchadnezzar and therefore also with God, which would ultimately result in his downfall. Ezekiel 17, 22 through 24 then describes the planting of the cedar sprig, which grows into a lofty tree, a figurative description of Messiah. 
but it's significant that Messiah himself is not described in Ezekiel 17 as a vine, but as a cedar tree. The vine imagery here applies to Zedekiah's disobedience. Jesus' description of himself as a true vine in John 15.1 is to be seen against this background, but it differs significantly from the imagery surveyed above. It represents new imagery, which differs significantly from Old Testament concepts. It appears to be original with Jesus. The imagery of the vine underscores the importance of fruitfulness in the Christian life and the truth that this results not from human achievement, but from one's position in Christ. Jesus is not just giving some comforting advice, but portraying to the disciples the difficult path of faithful servant. To some degree, the figure is similar to the head-body metaphor used by Paul with Christ as a head and believers as members of the body. Both metaphors bring out the vital and necessary connection which exists between Christ and the believers. So, this is a new thing, right? Jesus is saying he is the vine and that we have to be in him. Okay, so going back to this comment about like, okay, we're Israel. I've heard this before from a lot of different people. Usually they're in this Hebraic roots or I don't know, sometimes Messianic Juda Judaism or something. I, I don't know. They're in this thing where they think that they're being more original to the apostolic church with some of these Jewish traditions or interpretations. What they're normally referring to is um, Ju rabbinic Judaism, which postdates Christianity. A lot of times when people will say things like this, I, and they're having conversations like this, usually they're, I think they're still believers in Jesus, right? But what happens when you have a misunderstanding about what this means, and if you think that you become Jewish or something because you believe in Jesus, um, that's, that's an offness because what Jesus is saying here, you know, this is what it brings out in the comments. He's talking about a new thing. So Israel was the vine, right? But Jesus said, I am the true vine. You must be in me. So you must be in Jesus. And so I think that there are a couple of things that cause people to get off on this. So, and the first is just a misunderstanding of what a graft is. So, you know, people say, well, we're, we're grafted in. We're grafted into this vine. So we're grafted into Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. And so we're now Jewish. That's, that's not the way it works. So we're going to, we're going to go over some passages that talk about this. So the next time you have a chance, go into a garden store and ask them to show you a, a plant that's been grafted. So this is just a common agricultural practice. It's actually really common in roses and a lot of different um, fruits. The graft a particular type of fruit or a rose or something into a different rootstock because the other rootstock is more hardy. But it doesn't change what is the thing that's grafted into it. It's drawing the sustenance from the roots, but it still remains what it is. So there's this guy that's here locally that is really big into citrus, and he has what he calls a fruit cocktail tree, and he will graft all different types of citrus into one tree. So I don't, don't know like what the root tree is, but let's just say it's an orange. So they graft lemon or limes into it. It doesn't suddenly become oranges. It's still what it was originally. That's the whole concept of the graft. It's the separateness. You still are what you were to begin with. You're just getting this life from what is the root. And Jesus says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. Not the nation. Jesus is the true vine. So one of the consequences of this off belief, like I said, most of the time I think people are, when they're, we're having these conversations, I think they still are, you know, believers in Jesus. When your understanding of that is a little bit off and you think that, okay, you're Israel and you have this focus on Jewishness rather than on Jesus, then that's maybe just be a little bit off. But then when you go down the road, it gets further and further and further off. And I have seen so many people, so many people who have gotten into that whole pool of belief that go so far down the road that they end up denying Jesus entirely. There was a church here locally. The pastor got into it. It ended up basically splitting the entire, the whole church. It was just really a mess. It's really sad to see. And, and there's this, uh, a group called, uh, I think it's Jews for Judaism. They're a counter missionary group and their purpose is to deconvert Jewish believers. And they've said that they, they have so many people coming to them that have been in these sorts of groups that they don't even know what to do with them all because they've denied Jesus. And they're like, okay, now what? Okay. Can I just say this? 
So I was actually listening to something, a Jewish teaching, and they were talking about Messiah. And he was like, yeah, we just have to keep believing that Messiah is going to come. And I also uh, taught uh, my Bible study last week, and I was, I can't remember why, but I was explaining how in Judaism they have set readings for a year where they go through, it's like their Torah portion, they also read a portion in the prophets. So they go through the first five books of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible every year, and then bits of the rest of the Bible. So when you look at the listing of what they read, um, before the time of Christ, Daniel and Isaiah were two of the most well-respected books of the Old Testament. The Essenes had more copies of Daniel than I think any other book. And now if you look at the readings for the year, they read portions from Isaiah, skip around, but they very carefully read Isaiah. They do not read Isaiah 53. And they only read 21 verses from the whole book of Daniel, which is from chapter one. And when this man was saying, you know, we just have to keep believing, you know, Messiah is going to come. He came, you missed him. And if Jesus wasn't your Messiah, you're not getting one. And that's the thing about Daniel. And it says in Luke chapter three, that everyone was expecting the Messiah. So they were looking for him. And the reason that they did was because Daniel gave a very specific timeline. So they knew the time, right? But, but they, but they denied him. And so all of these people, like we as Christians, we should have a fuller understanding of that. We, you should have, you as a Christian should have a fuller understanding of a Jewish heritage and the purpose, God's purpose for them as a people than the Jewish people do today because they don't know who their Messiah is, right? And so there's the entire little pools of people that are going and sticking to rabbinic Judaism, which you're not getting a fuller picture of Jesus and what he believed by going to, to rabbinic Judaism, which postdates Christianity, which was, was written in, in, um, opposition to Christians. It's really kind of sad. So anyway, so back to this comment, that understanding is important. Okay. You have to understand that. And then there was in the same comment that this person made, they were talking about, you know, uh, end time stuff. If you don't understand who Jesus is, where salvation is and what Israel's purpose is, you can't understand end time prophecy. You just don't. That's pretty key. And this may sound like it's like a fine detail, but it's very, very important. We're, we are made right with God because we believe in God as our savior that we don't, not in our works, not in our heritage, not in anything else, but because we believe in that God alone can save us and that Jesus, who is God come as man is the only way. So he is a true vine. We have to be grafted into him. So we're going to go to John chapter eight and we're going to go to verse 33. And this is talking about who God's true children are. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples. If you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But we are descendants of Abraham. They said, we have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean? You will be set free. Jesus replied. I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. Yes, I realize that you are descendants of Abraham. And yet some of you are trying to kill me because there's no room in your hearts for my message. And I am telling you what I saw when I was with my father, but you are following the advice of your father. Our father is Abraham, they declared. No, Jesus replied, for if you were really the children of Abraham, you would follow his example. Instead, you're trying to kill me because I told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham never did such a thing. No, you are imitating your real father. They replied, we are illegitimate children. God himself is our true father. Jesus told them, if God were your true father, you would love me because I've come to you from God. I'm not here on my own, but he sent me. Why can't you understand what I am saying? It's because you can't even hear me, for you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So when I tell you the truth, you just naturally don't believe me. Which of you can truthfully accuse me of sin? And since I am telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? Anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the words of God, but you don't listen because you don't belong to God. So these are Jews, and he's saying you don't actually belong to God because he is a true line. So anyone has to have faith in the salvation of God, not in themselves, right? to be true children of God. 
Okay, so then we're going to go to Romans chapter 11. And this is talking about the right relationship with God. In this chapter, he's talking about you know, how Jesus came to the Jews. They rejected him. And this is verse 13. I'm saying all this, especially for you Gentiles. God has appointed me as the apostle to the Gentiles. I stress this. For I want somehow to make the people of Israel jealous of what you Gentiles have, so I might save some of them. For since their rejection meant that God offered salvation to the rest of the world, their acceptance will be even more wonderful. It will be life for those who are dead. And since Abraham and the other patriarchs were holy, their descendants will also be holy, just as the entire batch of dough is holy, because a portion given as an offering is holy. For if the roots of the tree are holy, the branches will be too. But some of these branches from Abraham's tree... Some of the people of Israel have been broken off, and you Gentiles, who are from wild olive tree, have been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. But you must not brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. You are just a branch, not the root. Well, you say those branches were broken off to make room for me. Yes, but remember, those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ. And you are there because you do believe. So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. Notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe towards those who but kind to you if you continue to trust in his kindness. But if you stop trusting, you also will be cut off. And if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted in again. For God has the power to graft them back into the tree. You, by nature, were a branch cut from a wild olive tree. So if God was willing to do something contrary to nature by grafting you into his cultivated olive tree, he will be far more eager to graft the original branches back into the tree where they belong. So here again is an illustration that, you know, we're, we're the wild olive branches. We're not, we're not the cultivated trees. So we don't become the cult cultivated just because we're grafted in. So next we're going to go to Galatians and chapter three. Now this, this whole thing was, um, the letter to Galatians was because some Judaizers had come from Jerusalem and were telling them that they need, needed to follow the, the Jewish law and the Jewish practices in order to be saved. And he says in the beginning of chapter three, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It's like, why are you believing this? And they understood it. And then they started getting confused. This is in chapter three, verse 26, for you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all of you who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, and now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. We are children of Abraham not because we are grafted into Israel. We're heirs of Abraham because we're grafted into Christ, because Abraham's faith was in the salvation of God, right? Genesis fifteen six, and Abraham believed God, and his faith was credited as righteousness. He believed God would do what he said. He put his trust in God. Abraham was grafted in. He was grafted in. We are grafted into the same vine that he is, right? Your salvation isn't in being Jewish. Salvation isn't in Jewish observances. It's being grafted into Christ because he's a true vine. So we're going to go to Ephesians where Paul explains this a little bit more clearly about that this neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. And this is in verse 11. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups 
to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility towards each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. We are one new man, right? So it's not, as he says in Galatians, it's not Jew or Greek, slave or free. It's one new man. So we're not grafted, we're not grafted into Israel. We're grafted into Jesus, just as Jews are grafted into Jesus. And that is who God's people are. So when Jesus said, I am the true vine, and these branches are grafted into him, he is creating that one new man, right? And we, and so we see that it's a matter of position, you know, being grafted into him, but also it's a matter of fruit. The warning is that anyone who doesn't bear fruit is going to be cut off. So I grew up on the farm. It wasn't a big farm. My parents didn't make a living from it. It was just kind of more of a hobby farm. And so when we first moved out there, we had like sheep and goats and cows and stuff, but we had animals and then they got rid of most of the animals and we had Christmas trees and blueberries. And so they only had one acre of blueberries. So it wasn't really enough to make a living off of. It was just enough to keep us busy the entire summer. So when they first started planting these blueberries, we pruned them back so the energy of the plant wasn't going into the fruit to begin with. So it could just, all that energy could focus on the growth of the plant. And one of the things I think is interesting about the Levitical laws, God gave them some guidelines of like, okay, these are good husbandry practices. This is what you should do. So those laws like not to take the fruit of a tree for the first three years, that's just that's just good practice. In some of these passages, we see references to pruning, right? And the thing about pruning is that when you prune things back, it's so that the the remaining branches will produce more fruit. I grew up in Oregon, but there's a I actually went to um, a local blueberry farm here in Texas, and the first time I went there, it was really kind of a shock because I was used to our blueberry farm where you know you would not find a weed in in the middle of the road. They would have ground cover on around the plants and. Um, my parents were really careful about pruning and we would sell blueberries fresh market, but they wouldn't let people come and pick them for you pick because when people would come, they would be really careless with the bushes. They would break the branches. They'd strip off fruit that wasn't ripe yet and, you know, just wasn't worth it. So they wouldn't let people be around the bushes that didn't know how to handle them because it wasn't just breaking off a single branch, there's a science to pruning these branches, right? To, to have the best fruit from them. So when I went out to this blueberry farm in Texas, it was just kind of a shock. I think I don't, I've never taken my parents out there, but I think they probably have a heart attack if they saw, you know, how these, these blueberries were. I mean, they're just humongous bushes. Like they'd never been pruned ever. And there's like grass growing up in the, in the rows. I mean, it was just, really, I, I, it was just amazing to me, like hardly any care towards those bushes. And the, the result was that there were very, the blueberries are small. Like and our blueberries, like some of the varieties, I'm not even joking, you would, blueberries like the size of a quarter, you'd have to take two bites of them. Huge. But it was because my parents put care into the bushes into pruning them. They would prune them back. They wouldn't let people just go and like, you know, rip through them. So as I was doing this the first time, because again, this is the second time I've done this Bible study, we have to be remain in Christ, right? We have to produce fruit. And so right now, what we're seeing in the church is a severe lack of fruit, a severe lack of good fruit, or it's a very limited fruit. It makes me think that maybe part of the reason that the spirit as a whole is so stifled is because there's been no pruning in the church. If somebody is doing things that they shouldn't, rather than exposing it and holding people to account, a lot of times we cover it up, right? And allow it to continue and don't address it. Especially if the person is a big wig or has a lot of money or is somebody, things won't be said. Or you see this a lot in church leaders. In the last few years, we've seen a lot of exposure but the thing is, there are a lot of people that knew about it all along and said nothing. And I think that may be why people say, well, the church is dying. And then you think that having certain justices on the Supreme Court are going to be the answer. That's not the answer. That's not the answer. And Zechariah says, not by force nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. 
And when this wrongness, when this sin is not excised, when it's not confronted and dealt with, then it permeates through the whole church and you're blocking the flow of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is convicting and saying, okay, this needs to be dealt with. But when you deny it, then you're basically pushing the Holy Spirit out. So if you want to see revival, if you want to see the growth of the church, rather than worrying about who's in a political office, maybe you need to start cleaning out the offices in the church. And maybe we need to start, you know, really examining what the dead weight is. So this accountability of people within the body, you see this in, Paul talks about this in Corinthians. First Corinthians has a letter to the church in Corinth, uh, calling them to account about someone who is in flagrant and deliberate sin, and they're doing nothing. They're just kind of letting it go. Paul tells them to throw the man out of the church, turn him over to Satan so his soul can be saved. And then he tells them, if you don't, I'm going to come and have a talk with you. When you have this sin in your church, then it spreads. This is a spirit that spreads. We were discussing that in the parable of the leaven. It permeates through the whole thing. There's this really widespread problem in the church about covering up a lot of things, about not dealing with leaders who are abusing their position or abusing people in the church. People are more likely to cover it up than confront. So false teachers, too. I mean, we're literally in a point right now where we're in a national crisis. And the biggest reason, I think, is really because of false teachers and false prophets in the church. And so today they're doubling down on it. It's just, it's just crazy. A lot in the New Testament about not giving any space at all to false teachers. So they're like ravening wolves. And it's a don't even give them, don't even give them food. You don't, don't allow that to continue. You have to confront it and excise it. Somebody replied to a comment I made a year ago. They're basically saying that there's no miracles. He actually said, oh yeah, you see, if you read the early church fathers, then you'll see that. And my reply, like, I have read them. And no, that's not what they say. They talk about miracles all the time. Like, Irenaeus against heresies has a whole section about miracles that they still see today. This is the second century. Augustine, City of God, fifth century, has entire chapters on miracles that he's seen. Craig Keener has a two-volume work on miracles, modern miracles. In his wife's uh, village, they have, like, almost a whole tribe of people that have been raised from the dead. Seriously. No, just because your prayers don't work when you pray doesn't mean that God doesn't do miracles. God doesn't answer. God doesn't change. Same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same Holy Spirit today. So if you're not seeing the same works of the Holy Spirit, uh, it's not the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's just a church. So what is it? We talked about this last week. Is it is it faith? Is it that we're not open to miracles? And I think that's part of it. But I also think there's all this dead weight. There's all this sin in the church. This is not being dealt with. And I think that can be a reason too. The letters to the church in Revelation, they're confronted about different things. Some of them are about pride and complacency. Some of them are about sin, but some of them are about false teachers. And he warns them that they need to deal with it and dress it, or he's going to come and remove their lampstand. And so I wonder how many churches we have functioning today that say that they're a church, but really there's no spirit there at all. Because they've denied the conviction of the Holy Spirit and they've allowed all this falseness and corruption to continue. And again, this is the second time I've done this Bible study, so it turned out a little bit different. You know, it's just important to remember that we've been given a great gift. We're accountable for that, for what we've been given. In the parable of the talents, everyone is given different gifts, but the person who did nothing with it, what was the master's response to them? It's a department for me, you workers of iniquity. He threw them out. So it's the same thing that Jesus is saying here. It's like, you must bear fruit. You must bear fruit. And any branch that doesn't bear fruit is going to be cut off. So anyway, those are my thoughts. And so that's John chapter 15, where Jesus says, I am the vine. So let's remember who we are grafted into. We're grafted into Jesus. He's our true vine. So let's just end this time with a prayer. Lord, I thank you so much for for today, and I thank you for your goodness and your grace to us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are our Jehovah Jireh, that you are our provider, and that you've provided your Holy Spirit to us to cleanse us and to make us whole. Lord, give us clean hearts, make us willing to obey you. Pour out your spirit of grace and supplication on each of us so that we are willing to humble ourselves before you and to 
admit what we've done wrong, and to confess our sins to you so that we can be healed and be made whole by you, Lord. We know that you are a good God that loves us and is always willing to restore us and be reconciled with us. So I pray for the favor and blessing of God over each person that listens. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, that's enough for today, and I'll see you next time.